asking your two-year-old to the restroom right before you preach. There's so many variables that could go wrong there, and I'm um, thankful that I survived that. Uh, well, next week is our Vision Sunday, and it's where we take uh, one opportunity a year just to update you on our Vision 2020 and uh, how God is, is working in our vision and uh, to remind you what that vision is. And so uh, I really am excited about next week and uh, hope that you'll be back here for that. Uh, we also will have uh, an opportunity to have our baby dedications next week as well, so it'll be a, it'll be a great week. Uh, but I really believe that today's message is vital for the preparation of next week's message, that in order for us to uh, talk about uh, our vision, we really need to understand what the implications of today's message mean. And so that's why I believe today's message is so Im important, that if we don't get the truth uh, of today's message, then we'll miss the point of next week's update. Uh, so uh, we're going to be in, in Galatians chapter 2 in, in just a moment. And uh, Paul really says something in the, in the book of Galatians. He, he coins this phrase, the truth of the gospel. And as I was reading back through the, the whole letter to the Galatians yesterday, there's, there's this phrase there in the first chapter, uh, it's chapter 1, verse 6. It's not on your screen, but I came across this. I, I'm astonished, Paul says, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And so the, the title of today's message is, is there's only, only one gospel. We have been in the series called Oneness, where we've been examining Jesus' prayer uh, to make us one. And, and today I want to really cap it off by reminding us of what, what is for Paul the, the one gospel, that there's only, there's only one and Paul sets up the book of Galatians this way, that there, there really is only one gospel. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that today as our, our title. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at three uh, aspects, of you, if you will, of the gospel. We're going to look at the heart of the gospel. And then we're going to look at the centrality of the gospel, how it is central to everything we do. And then finally, we're going to look at the power of of the gospel. And then after, after we look at these three components, then we're going to ask three very simple, yet I believe uh, heart convicting questions uh, about the gospel in your life, in your own life. And, and so uh, Galatians chapter 2 is, is where we'll begin. And we actually looked at this last week in our message. And we're going to just remind ourselves of what this passage says, but then go a step further as to what Paul is trying to teach us here. So Galatians 2, verse 11, uh, when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him, I being Paul, who's writing this letter, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Verse 13, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Just a, a reminder of a little background here of what's going on, that you have Peter who has received this, this vision in, in Acts 10. This, this sheet comes down, and, and there's all these unclean animals, as we talked about last week. And, uh, but, but Peter has been associating with the Gentiles, Gentiles just meaning non-Jew. And Peter himself is a Jew. But he's been associating with the Gentiles. He's been eating with them. He's been fellowshipping with them. But all of a sudden, this circumcision group comes into town. Uh, these are, are kind of the, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem. They, they come into town, and as soon as they come into the town, now Peter kind of draws back and separates himself from these people that he's been associating with. And he even starts telling the Gentiles to start acting more like the Jews. 
And Paul calls him out on this. Paul says, Peter, you're not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. And we see uh, this, this apostle to apostle uh, opposing him to his face, as, as Scripture says. And then Paul gets to the heart of the gospel. Look with me in verse 15, Galatians 2. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And here we see uh, this reversal of the normal order of what you find uh, in most religions. The, the reversal of the order is, is, is hinging on this, this word justified. And justified just means to be right with God. And how do you get right with God? Well, ordinarily, in, in most religions, you get right with God by obeying the works of the law. If you do this, 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 and this, then you'll be right with God. And Paul comes along and says, here's the gospel. You're put right with God, not through the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. And, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that Christians just who believe the gospel say, oh, well, the law doesn't matter anymore. Uh, we, can, we can just go live any way we want. No, no, no. We, we don't promote sin, as, as Paul is going to say. Look what he says in verse 17. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. And last week we, we looked at this situation and what was going on in, in Galatians chapter 2 with Peter and the circumcision group. And I want to remind us today, catch this church, I, I want to remind us that the circumcision group is, is not who we oftentimes think they were. Uh, oftentimes we, we just we think of, of this group as, as just being so far from, from everything that, that Jesus stood for. But the reality is, is that the circumcision group, they believed in Christianity. The circumcision group, they, they believed that, that Jesus died on the cross. They, they believed that he rose from the dead. They believed all that. But what the circumcision group did, what, what these, these teachers did, was that they said, you also have to observe. Yeah, yeah, believe, all, believe that, Jesus, cross, resurrection, all that. But you also have to observe the Mosaic law. You need to be circumcised. You need to obey the, the dietary laws, and, and then you'll be saved. And, and that was the crux, church. And I don't, I don't want us to miss this. The, the, the crux was that it was a battle of orders. I want that to, to set with us for just a moment. It was a battle of orders. One, one scholar says it this way, that the central point and issue between Paul and the circumcision group concerned an order of three steps. For the circumcision group said, number one, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, keep the law that, the best that you can. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number two, keep the law the best that you can. And then number three, then you'll be saved. This is, this, is what the, the, this is the order that the circumcision group operated out of. And then Paul said, the gospel is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in the, in the next cha chapter, chapter 3 in Galatians, he says, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And then Paul says, that, number two, is why you are saved. And then, number three, then you proceed to keep the law of God. Notice the difference in the orders. The order, this, that was the order. Do you obey in order to be saved, or are you saved and therefore you obey? Or put it like this, I obey so that I will be 
love and accept it by God. That's, that's one order that we operate out of or that we can't operate out of. Or do you say, I'm already loved and accepted by God and, and Jesus Christ, and therefore I obey? Notice, notice the difference in the two orders. I obey, and therefore I am loved and accepted. In the gospel orders, I'm accepted in Jesus Christ, and therefore I obey. And it sounds like, well, what, we're just kind of, you know, chasing rabbits here. You know, what's, what's the difference in the, in the two orders? And I want to suggest to you that, that as, as we look at the, the letter to the Galatians, that, that these two orders are two different planets. These two orders are two completely different worlds. And that's, and that's why Paul is so adamant about, about opposing Peter to his face on this. I mean, he's operating out of, out of two completely different orders. And why that's so peculiar to some of us is that, look, remind, remind yourself, both orders include obedience. You could have two people sitting right next to each other, both practicing obedience, but, but practicing it out of two completely different orders. And this is what Paul is addressing. He's addressing the matter of orders. Because if you obey God in order to be accepted and get blessed out of the first order that we mentioned, you're obeying out of this anxiousness. There's this anxiety because you never know if you're obeying enough. And it's also selfish. Why? Because you're obeying in order to get some kind of a blessing. You're obeying in order to, uh, out, of, out of your own selfishness, out of your own desires. And so not only is, does it produce this anxiousness, not only does it produce this selfishness, it's also a burden. It's also joyless. And I think we, we have to catch this order that, that Paul is, is addressing. And he, he goes on to say that, but what if, uh, what if you obey because you've already gotten everything in Christ? Love, acceptance, a guaranteed future with him. Then why would you obey? Well, then you would obey for a, a totally different reason. Again, a planet apart from, from what we just described in that first order. The motivation would, would be joy. I, I'm, I'm doing it for God's sake, not my sake. I'm loving my neighbor for my neighbor's sake, not my sake. It's a, it's a, completely, it's a completely different order. Do you understand the difference between the two orders? I think that's the question that, that Paul would be asking us today. Do you understand the difference between the two orders? Many people only know an obedience that is filled with anxiety, and as a result, they don't, know, they don't know what Paul is talking about. They don't know this way of obeying. Always anxious. You have to look down at somebody else in order for you to feel worth or you to feel your own righteousness. Always fighting about who's, who's got the right doctrine or who's living the right way. Two, two radically different orders. And that's why Paul spends a whole letter addressing this very topic. And, and I want to encourage you uh, this week, yourself or, or your connect group or your family, to, to sit down and read the whole letter to Galatians. It, it won't take you more than 20, 30 minutes probably. But to sit down and read that whole letter, and maybe, maybe you commit to reading it every day this week. Uh, or maybe you, you at least read a chapter a day. But I, I want to encourage you to challenge one another to read the, the whole letter to the book of Galatians. Two radically different orders. One gospel, Paul says. One order. And the gospel order produces what? The gospel order produces a certain kind of fruit. What is that fruit? It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. 
gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That, that is the fruit that, that gospel order number one, because of God's spirit in us, produces. What is produced by this, the other order? Anxiety, anger, bitterness, burden. The heart of the gospel, church, is living out of this order that Paul is absolutely adamant about. That's the heart of the gospel. And then Paul goes on to say uh, something else in verse 19. And, and number two, we want to talk about the centrality of the gospel. So that's the heart of the gospel. Now, now let's think about the centrality of the gospel. And look at verse 19 in Galatians 2. For through the law I died to the law. So that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. And that's one of the, the few exclamation points in the book of Galatians. And so when Paul says this, he's pretty serious about this, this statement. He even puts this exclamation point on it, that the gospel is that when you become a Christian and you put your faith in Christ, you're crucified with Christ. And what, what does that mean? It means that when you, you become a Christian, that you're un, united with him. You're, you're united with Christ. And it means God sees us as, as free from condemnation. He sees us as if you were the one who had died on the cross. He sees us. You've been crucified with Christ. And it sounds like this great paradox. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I live, yet not and that I, but yeah, you, just, you just think, well, wait a minute, I, I've been crucified, I've died, but, but yet I, I live, and, and the life that I now live is in the flesh, and it's lived by faith in the Son of God, and, and it's, it seems like this, this huge paradox that's going on, but, 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 but Paul is adamant that this is the only, only way that we can, we can live. Another way of looking at it is, is not only did Christ get your sins on the cross, catch this, not only did, did Christ get your sins on the cross, everything that you've done, everything that you've ever done in your life that is against the will of God, Christ took all of that on the cross, but not only did he get all of your sins, you also got all of his righteousness. <laughs> what? What religion is preaching that? Not, not only did, did Christ get, get all of your, your sins, but you, you became the righteousness of God. That you got all of Jesus' righteousness. It's like his medals are pinned on your chest. Do you understand the difference between the two orders? Martin Luther was studying Romans because he had to teach it. And most of you uh, know that when you have to teach something, uh, you end up being the one that's, that's probably transformed as much, if not more, than anybody else. You know, there's just there's, there's so much that, that God has to work on you. Uh, you know, a 30-minute sermon, uh, or we may go two hours today, I don't know, but a 30-minute sermon, uh, it takes... Uh, you know, there's, there's hours that go into that all, all week long. And the way that God just continues to work on me, and, and you who teach, you know that. And, and so Martin Luther, who was instrumental in beginning the Re Reformation in 1517 with the 95 Theses that he, he pinned on the wall, he was studying the book of Romans. And he got to this verse pretty early on in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And Luther said that when he was studying this, that when, when he discovered the distinction between the two orders, when he discovered that the law is one thing and the gospel is another thing, he says he broke through. 
he broke through. It doesn't mean, just, just like in the same way that none of us, you know, we, we never come to this, this full understanding where we have all knowledge and all wisdom of how something, you know, it, it's not wisdom, but, but there was this breaking through from one order to the next order. And virtually every person that I have met in my life, myself included, has had to break through from one order to the other. Now, now, there are some people, very few that I've, I've met, that, that grow up understanding the gospel. But what I have experienced in my own life and in, in the lives of those that I have talked to is that there is this breaking through that has to occur. Have you broken through from, from one order to the gospel? Have you, have you broken through? So, so how are we supposed to function in light of the gospel? Because... A lot of times we say, and I know I've, I've said it myself, we say, well, well, fine, yes, Jesus died for our sins, and, and you have to believe him, and, and yes, you know, he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. Yes, 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 we know that. But, but us seasoned folks, we need a little more advanced theology. We, we, need, a, a little, we need to go beyond the gospel now. I've even had folks come up several years ago when I was preaching. I would, somebody came up to me and said, you know, no, the, the, this, this gospel stuff that you're preaching is great, but we need to go beyond that. We need to go to the next step. We need to go to the, to the next level. And, and, and church, I need to remind us that the gospel is not the ABCs of Christianity. It's the A through Z of Christianity. It, it's, it's the whole, it's the Alpha and the Omega. It, it is the beginning and the end of Christianity. And unless we are reminded of that, Paul, Paul does not say uh, to Peter, hey, 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 Peter, you're, you're disobeying the, the no racism rule. Paul doesn't say that to Peter. He, he very well could have said that to Peter. But, but he's asking Peter a more direct, more central question question is the gospel the, the center of your life Paul looks at Peter and says you've forgotten the gospel Peter you're not applying the truth of the gospel to the way you treat people of other races and I just want to ask us this morning church in the way that you do your work and and your career is that in line with the gospel is the way you do school and the way you do athletics and the, and the way you you do extracurricular activities is that in line with the gospel is your sexuality in line with the gospel? Is the way that you think about the poor and the needy in line with the gospel? Is what you do with your money in line with the gospel? It's, it's an election year. Is the way that you treat the person on the other side of the political spectrum in line with the gospel? Paul could have put pressure on Peter's will. And he could have said, Peter, stop being a racist. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. Does he want Peter's behavior to change? Absolutely he wants Peter's behavior to change. But Paul says, I'm going after your heart, Peter. You say you believe that the gospel is what it is, but it hasn't affected your heart. The gospel must become central to everything you do. And one of the fundamental questions that we have to ask in this life, or one of the fundamental questions I think that all of us ask from time to time, is this question, do I have value? Do I have worth? Most of us, either consciously or unconsciously, ask, ask that question, on a pr pretty regular basis. Do I have value? Do, do I have worth? And one of the ways that we answer that question is, we can, is that we can look at other people who are different than us and think ourselves to be better. Maybe it's a person of a different ethnicity. Maybe it's a person of a different socioeconomic background. Maybe it's a person whose intellect is not at our level. Maybe it's even romance. I need to be needed, and this is where I find my value. This is where I find my worth. 
But in every case, what are we doing? In every one of those cases, you're trying to justify yourself. I matter. I have worthiness. I mean, we're, we're desperate for worthiness. We're, we're desperate for value. We're, we're desperate that, that we actually matter in this life. And if Paul was here today, and if you had the misfortune of talking to Paul one-on-one, Paul would, would, do you think he would say, stop doing those things? <laughs> stop trying to find value in those things. And if he, if he told you that, how effective would that be? How effective would it be for Paul to say, just stop it. Stop doing, stop trying to find value in those things. I think Paul realized the same thing with Peter. Just to tell him to stop a certain behavior wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be all that effective. But church, here's the deal. The gospel is the end to your desperate hunt. It's not based on your record. It's based on Jesus' record. But here's, here's the challenge, is that most of us are like, or we find ourselves being like this coin in the next picture, this coin of being put into a drink machine and a lot of times, we, we intellectually, we know the words. I could probably give us a test on the gospel. And we know the words. We could probably even define justification and some of those things. But have we let the coin drop? Have we let the coin drop into our heart? Or is it still just staying right up there? at the top of the Coke machine. And the reason that I share this picture is because it's, it's one that's true for me in my own life. And here's what Paul says, Peter, Peter, remember the gospel. Don't forget the gospel. Martin Luther said the, the following on justification. He said, and this is the truth of the gospel. It is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine wherein the knowledge of all godliness consists. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know this article well, teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continually. I love that. I absolutely love that. Because I'm one of those who needs to have it beat into my head continually. You'll never change your heart, church, by moral reformation. You will never change your heart simply by getting the biblical principles and going out and trying to apply them this week. All the change that your heart needs, all the change that your life needs is praying, worshiping, rejoicing over what God through Christ has done for you. The gospel is central to everything. And lastly, the power of the gospel. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for the righteousness, if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Folks, do you realize that when we operate out of the order of the circumcision group, when we operate out of that order, when we say, yes, yes, believe in Jesus, but, dot, 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 but, dot, 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 do you realize what we are saying by our actions, even if we're not verbally confessing it? We are saying that Christ died for nothing. That's a bold statement. And one that I may have not verbally said in my life, but by my actions at times, I have said that. That Christ died for nothing. Paul says to Peter, remember the gospel. There's a sense in which when you become a Christian, that you go into Christ. That you go into Christ and you disappear. 
God doesn't see your sin. He sees you and the beauty of Jesus. And he's no longer... Do you look at anything else out there and say, well, if I just have that, then I'll feel worth, and now I feel value. And if I just do this, this, and this, and this, then I'll feel worth, then I'll feel value. No, 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 no. I'm in Jesus Christ. He's my worth. He's my value. Now you feel joy and gratitude for the one who loved you and gave himself for you. The gospel changes the motivational structure of your heart. It changes your personal identity. It changes your social identity. Do you understand the power of the gospel? So next week when we're talking about our vision 2020, when we talk about reaching the homeless, when we talk about partnering with a local school, when we talk about becoming debt-free as a church, when we talk about sending missionaries to Rwanda and Tanzania, and works that we do in Honduras, when we talk about all that next week, if we miss the heart of the gospel, church, we have missed it. We've missed everything if we miss this. And that's why I believe Paul was so adamant about the gospel, the one gospel and the particular order of that gospel. I was 21 years old. I was on staff at a church. I'd been a Christian for 10 years. And it was the book of Galatians. And a man by the name of Jeff Shelton who taught the book of Galatians to me that caused me to break through. That I broke through from the one order to the gospel order. I'm still learning. But it changed my life and it changed the way that I now obey. It's radically different. It's completely different. So, friends, three questions as we close. Number one is, have you broken through? Have you broken through from the order of the circumcision group that Paul talks about to the order of the gospel? The second question is, do you understand the power of the gospel? Do you find your worth and your value in something else? The gospel is the end to our desperate hunt, church. And the last question is, are you unashamedly living out of that power? That power that comes from the gospel. Three questions, very simple, yet I believe life-changing. Will you bow with me as we pray this morning? Father, help us to know the best way to work the gospel into the depths of our lives and to proclaim this gospel to the city of Birmingham so that people can see its life-transforming work. And Father, help us to do that in in a gospel-centered way. (laughs) Help us to do that humbly. Help us to do that graciously. Help us to, to teach this truth in love. Father, we need your help. We need the guidance of your spirit. And so today, God, we ask that we will not leave this room unchanged, but that we will be reminded of the heart, the centrality, and the power of the gospel. And that's the good news that provides the marching orders for our life. 
God, thank you for this faith family. Thank you for every, every hearer of the word today. Father, as we listen to the word, may we not be unaffected by it, but by, may we live, leave, leave here changed by it, God. And we thank you for that. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask us to be standing. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. And as we do, every week, uh, we'll have a shepherd down front. We'll also have a shepherd, his wife, back here in the chapel if you'd like a more private setting. If today's the day that you want to break through, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you want to be baptized into him and say, yes, Lord, you are mine, my Lord and my Savior. We want to celebrate that with you today. If you will, come as we sing this song. Create in me a clear